Who is Jesus to you? In your eyes, who is Jesus? His name is Yeshua. Okay. okay. Jesus is, uh, first, the J is a, is a recent letter. The J is not that old. So it really was originally Isus. And that name, Isus, means Hail Zeus. Okay. So you're calling on Zeus when you say Jesus. Now, one of the Sumerian people who converted over to the Greek gods. But when you, his name is Yeshua. And so Yeshua to me, very powerful person, uh, very spiritual, high level of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a student of the Egyptian mysteries. When Jesus disappears from the Bible, he actually ends up in Egypt. Okay. You can find this information in a book that was kept out of the biblical text called the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. And in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, he shows up in Egypt. And we know that's a fact because I take people on tour every year to Egypt, and I take them to the house that Jesus lived in. It's a crypt. It's actually worship. People come there to see that bed that he laid in every single year. When I take people there, we take them straight there. Uh, so, And we know the path that he traveled throughout Egypt because it's a, a huge sign outside that Coptic church where he lived that shows where he went. Now, when he was in Egypt, what did he go there for? To learn the Egyptian mysteries. Who taught the Egyptian mysteries? Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, the person I wrote, wrote this book about. Uh, and so Thoth was the teacher of the ancient Egyptian mysteries, or the ancient mysteries of what, what it was called. And then he leaves there, and he goes to Tibet to learn Qigong and Reiki healing, which was confirmed by the Dalai Lama. And then he heads down into India to learn the mystic arts, teaching reincarnation all the way back. Then the Bible picks him up at the age of 32. I call my son out of Egypt. He shows up on the back of a donkey, proclaims himself to be the Messiah. So it's a big story. I think that he had a big message. I don't think people were able to grasp it at the time. But his message was that not that he was coming back, but that the Christ would return, the Christ consciousness. Where, where did you get this info? What book did you read that said this? Because this isn't, you didn't come up with this. You read this from somewhere. What, what, what did you read that told you this? The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Another apocrypha text that was you know, kept out of the main, the canonized Bible. Got it. And what, that's what you learned from this. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let me ask you, there, there's, there's a lot of people that, um, you know, smart people, mathematicians, a lot of skeptics that are out there as well. How many people agree with what you have to say? How many people agree with this? Well, I got 8 million people following my accounts across all platforms. I mean, I don't know. So I'm not talking about that part. Of course, you know, when, when, you're, when you're talking with this level of firmness, there's a lot of, uh, uh, that's why I'm curious. I'm curious to know, you know how you come up with your beliefs. Yeah. But how, wh why is it if that's what you believe in, more people don't believe in that? Why do you think well, it's such a small sect? When you're born, you're given a name, a race, and a religion, right. and you spend the rest of your life defending a false identity. You don't know who you are. I don't know who I am. You, you, don't, you were given your name. I was given my name. Who's Billy Carson? I didn't come up with that name. Somebody gave me that name. And then somebody said, get on your knees and pray before you go to bed. Say the Lord's Prayer before you go to bed. And so I got on my knees and I said the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, you know. But then when you trace back that Lord's Prayer, whose prayer is that? That's the prayer of Ptah. Who's Ptah? Ia Enki from the Sumerian tablets. He wrote that prayer in ancient cuneiform, which then made it all the way into the Bible. And you think you're praying to God. You're saying the prayer of Ptah. <laughs> so we've been brainwashed. We've been programmed because for generations we keep getting handed down this system uh, where we're given this false creation of who we are and we believe it wholeheartedly, we'll fight for it to the absolute death. People will die over those things that were given to them, not that they came up with on their own, on their own uh, initially or originally. Uh, so it's a dangerous thing because we have a lot of people walking around that just took the programming code and they don't even understand really who they are, what they're all about. That's why so many people don't walk in their passion. So many people don't even know what their passion is because they've been given and told what their passion is going to be. And they have no clue how to find out who they really truly are or what they would love to be involved in or what their passion truly is. So we have a lot of NPCs walking around, non-players out here just walking around, have no clue, just programs in the matrix. But then you have a few of us that have discovered who we are, that are working on trying to, to, to go to inner space instead of outer space, dig deep within ourselves, learn how to walk in our power, find out what our passion is, maximize that, and access that power, and spread that power throughout the world. Would you say your parents were Christians? They were, they were quasi-Christians. So they didn't go to church, but you know, my dad would make me do book reports on the Bible from the time I was a little kid. Uh, my mother would make me say the prayers, you know? Um, so that, in that way, they were Christians. When did you stop? I stopped probably, I say, 
maybe around 12 or 13, I realized something was too much, there was too much contradiction in the, in the text. Because remember, I'm doing book reports on the biblical text. And when I got to the point where God said, I create the good and I create the evil, do what I say at the Lord, that's in Isaiah, then I realized something was really off here because I realized through my studies that God had killed over 3 million people in the Bible and the Satan didn't kill anybody. <laughs> So I said, wait a minute, something's a little off here. He's killing everybody, and Satan didn't kill anybody. And so we have to really take a look. And the deeper I dug into Deuteronomy, then I realized there's something wrong. I, what it was at that moment, I couldn't figure out, but I just knew something was a little off. I dabbled in it again later on to see maybe if there was something that I missed. And again, later on in my life, in my like late 20s, I said, it just doesn't make any sense. There's too many question marks. And every time you ask a question, they say, don't ask, don't question God. Don't question the Lord. Blind faith. And I'm thinking, if I'm going to put all of my eternity into one book, if I'm saying this one book is going to lead me to eternity, and I don't know everything about it, every aspect about it, I can't question it, I can't dig deeper to get more knowledge out of it, then I think there's something wrong with that. I think there's something being hidden from me. And I'd rather be able to dig deeper, get more knowledge, get more understanding, versus people shunning me away from trying to dig deeper to get more answers and I think that's a big problem. And I think the people that are shunning away and getting and stopping you from getting those answers don't have the answers themselves. When you, so let me go back to something you said. You said, when I read the Bible, Deuteronomy, you went to multiple different books in the Bible, right? And you said, you know, what I'm noticing here is, you know, God killed three million, but the devil, you know, I don't hear anything about the devil. What did you mean by that? Well, what I'm saying is well, you have to understand that a lot of the orders for death, including Sodom and Gomorrah, are being created or being ordered by God himself, if it isn't even a him. I don't believe it's a gender at all. But this is why I'm saying these people, the person that's being considered to be God in the Bible, I don't think is an actual creator of the universe. I think we're mistaking the creator of the universe for a person, for people, different people that exist within that text that have been masquerading as gods, according to the ancient tablets. They came here, they engaged mankind. If you read the book of Enoch, you discover like the angel Azazel, comes down, mm -hmm. right? he comes from the sky down to earth. He teaches, the first thing he teaches us is how to make weapons. Let me show you how to smelt this steel and make this sword that can cut through anything. Let me show you how to make a breastplate. Let me show you how to make a shield so that you can repel a blade and all these kind of things. And then he even goes out and helps humans kill people. You know, so uh, what you, these, these, these are not, these are not what they call quote unquote angels. In my opinion, these are what people call aliens or advanced. I call them advanced beings because we look a lot like them and they look a lot like us. There is some distinction. That you, they, they were d distinguishable from humans, but they look just like humans in the biblical text. In the, in the Bible, in some texts, they call them the Anak, A-N-A-K, the Anunnaki, the Anak. They say we were, we were grasshoppers in their eyesight. They were big people. Uh, and these people came from heaven to earth. And in the Nituru, in ancient Egypt, they say the Nituru came down from heaven to earth and turned mud into a kingdom. In the Aboriginal culture, the Aboriginal elder, I've been, on, I've been on walkabouts in the outback. The Aboriginal elders, verbal handed down history for thousands of years. We were seated on this planet by the Pleiadians. They brought us here. We were the first people here. You go to the Hopi tribe, the Lakota tribe. Our star brothers seated us on this planet. I mean, we, we keep slapping our ancient ancestors in the face, doubting their wisdom and doubting their understanding of what really happened. Uh, and doubting their drawings that they left behind and their texts they left behind by coming up with their own modern day mainstream idea of what we think happened when they left the proof and the evidence right for us. So in your rights, you think Jesus was an alien? I think Jesus was half human, half alien, and I'll tell you why. When you look at the, uh, the ap Apocrypha text, you discover, first of all, in the regular Bible, you discover he's born of a virgin birth, right? But then in the Apocrypha text, you discover that his grandmother was also born of a virgin birth. So it seems like this establishment of a bloodline there specifically. When you read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, you discover that he talks about he developed the ability to incarnate at will on and in any plane that he desires. That's pretty powerful stuff. He's saying he can come back however he wants and when he wants and in any, any dimension that he wants. Uh, he even talks about having rejuvenation chambers, which is what I believe the Serapium is located in Saqqara in Egypt is, is, is one of his rejuvenation chambers where they would actually uh, create bodies and put bodies in these gigantic megaton stone boxes made of granite and diorite, which are still radioactive, by the way. You can take your Geiger counter, they're still radioactive. They have an energy source coming out of them. 
And then he said that we, I would transfer my consciousness from one body to the next. He would leave another body in there rejuvenating for 100 years, and he'd come back and get it. And he'd do that over and over again. And that, by that method, he lived through eons. Pretty interesting. So I think maybe they decided to come back through a womb. Got it. What's your level of certainty on that? My level of certainty? Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure, man. I feel pretty confident in it. You know, I, I, the re, and the reason why is because I've just, I've just done the work. I've read so much information, and I've been able to put together so many dots. And I think that the average person is saying, wow, sounds outrageous because this is what I was taught in school. And all they have is the level of what their parents told them and what the school told them. And the school, we know, robs your identity and it robs your creativity and it robs your consciousness. It puts you into a prison mindset. You just become an NPC. And what your parents are giving you is handed down, um, you know, stuff from generations ago that a lot of the times really is just, you know, old tradition that really has nothing to do with real science, real knowledge, real investigation. My research and investigation is second to none. I'll stand by my research and investigation against anyone. Because like I said, I've gone out there. I put the time and I put the effort in. Am I 100% correct on everything? Probably not, because nobody is. We're human beings. But at the same time, I, I, my work is pretty strong. My, my ability to put together circumstantial evidence is very strong. And in America, if you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can convict somebody of a crime. Take that same mindset and put it out into the field of archaeology, ancient civilizations, quantum physics, science, and anything else. You could begin to build circumstantial evidence. And if you could put enough things together that begin to make sense, people just can't see them because they're so spread out. A lot of the stuff I research is on different timelines. So you might take something from 6,000 B.C. and find something in 1100 A.D. that connect together. But because people only specialize in 6,000 B.C., mm -hmm. they never get to 1100 A.D. That's another specialist. So what, I'm a person that, co that collects all the data.